from the Denver Broncos Media Center. Welcome to Broncos Country Tonight with Ryan Edwards and Benjamin Albright. All right, welcome to Broncos Country tonight, breaking down day two of Broncos training camp, and it was another entertaining day with the quarterbacks. I like what you said on Twitter, and I think this is an appropriate way to start this thing. You said, if you're judging the disparity of opinion between Locke and Teddy Bridgewater, it's likely because of the lens you're looking through on what's most important to get out of that position, because Mm -hmm. Teddy Bridgewater today was clearly the more efficient quarterback. He was clearly the more consistent quarterback Mm -hmm. throughout the course of the entire practice. Drew Locke struggled, I'd say, for probably close to 75% of practice, but he closed very strong, where yesterday he started off slow and then, you Mm -hmm. know, kind of fell apart at the end. So it's an interesting way to kind of look at this thing, and and it's more about what helps them win games at this point. At the, at the end of the day, your quarterback needs to score points, and which quarterback is going to put more points on the board and also not be a little liability? Both these quarterbacks, in terms of turnovers, pretty similar last year. I Drew Locke had, what, 18 turnovers total last year. Teddy Bridgewater had 16 total turnovers um, you know, between the fumbles and interceptions. It, they're pretty similar. Um, the, the problem with Teddy Bridgewater is that, while, well, yes, he's more efficient, and that completion percentage number goes up, the, the, other, the, the points per drive are actually fewer. Drew Locke leads you to more points. And, you know, I, I don't know. That's not me trying to stand for Drew Locke. I, I'm not trying to do that, but I'm just trying to say there's context to this. People look at Drew Locke's raw completion percentage and the interception number, and they just kind of dismiss everything else. Drew doesn't take sacks. He doesn't put the offense behind the chains. Teddy Bridgewater takes a lot of sacks. The offense gets behind the chains, and then they're forced to punt because he's not able to get that first down. So uh, this quarterback competition, and, and I've, I've used the, the phrase jokingly, but it really kind of is a, a microcosm of the Alex Smith the versus Jay Cutler argument. You know, which one do you want? Do you want the guy who's going to push the ball down the field and you're going to score points, but you're going to get turned over sometimes? Or do you want the guy who's going to dink and dunk you to death and uh, get Brandon McManus one more big contract because you're going to be winning games nine to six? Yeah, and both quarterbacks can make plays with their legs, although I thought today Drew did a really good job in, in the red zone period specifically of moving around and buying time and letting his receivers get open. Drew is better with his legs. Of the yeah. two, Drew is, Drew is better with his legs. He's a better athlete. He's better with his legs. Um, that, and that's evident. Like when Teddy was, was running for the end zone, he didn't make it. He did not make it. But <laughs> um, Drew had a shot at it. And if nothing else, while he's moving, it allows guys to sort of settle, settle into in, zones right. or settle into spots where there's a, a void and there might be an opportunity for a touchdown. And he, right. got a, he got a couple that way. But he also, simultaneously being kind of what he is, he forced a ball to Noah Fant in the back of the end zone in a double coverage that got popped straight up in the air. Mm-hmm. And I'd say nine times out of 10, that's going to be an interception for the defense. Yeah, it looked like it was going to be. And and so that's that's the trade-off here. And I don't think there's a right answer. Some people are going to settle on, well, this team can win with, you know, with that kind of stuff. I saw Kansas City play with Alex Smith, and I can tell you, you'll make the playoffs, but you'll make the playoffs. And then you'll get beat. Then you get beat by the Indianapolis Colts, who will come back on you, and because they can, you know, that kind of thing. So it, it, it really is that kind of trade off. Is is can Drew go into grow into the guy where the clock is sped up enough and he's consistent enough that you can win with that, or do you just default to Teddy Bridgewater in the in the you know slow try to move it down the the, the field dink and dunk kind of stuff, which we did with Case Keenum, who's basically the same quarterback, and and go from there and that's that's really what you're you're settled on here and i, I don't you know the one thing i do get tired of is the should have drafted justin field stuff well they didn't they he was not in consideration they didn't draft him the draft pats are 10 so this is what we have instead of lamenting about what you don't have this is what you have how do you win with what you have well and and, and just one quick thing on the justin fields thing because I, again i was one of the people that wanted justin mm-hmm. fields you remember that i was the one kind of pounding the table saying that you should absolutely do that what would you be doing different right now? Would you really want a three-headed monster in a quarterback competition? That's not, there's not enough reps to go around for everybody to get what they need. We already said coming into training camp that Drew Locke needs snaps. He needs time on the field to develop. We know what Teddy Bridgewater is. He, mm-hmm. he probably needs fewer snaps, but mm-hmm. again, he's acclimating to this offense. He's acclimating to the weapons around him. If you now throw in a rookie that you have to absolutely get some snaps to and you got to find out what he is, mm-hmm. Then what? I mean, and, and now you're splitting it three ways. I mean, Brett Rippon right now is getting probably 5 to 10% of practice reps and doing the most of what he can with it. But in the end, we know he's not competing for the starting job. If you throw another guy in there all of a sudden that's competing for the starting job, I think it muddies the waters. And I think somebody, if not two players in that, in that formula, end up not getting everything they need. I agree. And and I, I think that that's, you know, it, with coaching staffs with jobs on the line, a rookie quarterback was never going to be, you know, that wasn't going to be a strong consideration anyway. So the Broncos have what they have right now, and this is what they're going to have. So they need to figure out which of these gives them the better option to win, better chance to win. And, you know, I, 
I, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. And I know a lot of people think I'm a Drew Locke stand. Just, I just try to recontext things because I see most people missing the context on Drew Locke. Not that uh, pro, anti, or whatever. Uh, Teddy Bridgewater's a guy. Fully support Teddy Bridgewater. But for me, I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. I don't know if uh, having razor-thin margins with Teddy Bridgewater because you're dinking and dunking and you can't have anything go wrong while you do that to try to win games is the way to go versus the Drew Locke thing where he's going to make some mistakes, but he can also bring you back. I mean, look at the Chargers game where he brought him back. Absolutely. You know, look at what happened in Miami when he brought him back, or here against Miami, rather. Um, you know, and in the Carolina game, I mean, he, he was the man among boys. So, uh, you know, I, I, I think that I don't have an answer. I don't know, and that's... That's unsettling. I think that's what's unsettling for the fan base and why we see so much of this toxicity out there. The Broncos last two years, seven, little over 17 points per game in 2019, 20 points per game roughly in 2020. So for me, this is a little bit of a math equation. Who gives you the best chance to get the 24, 27 points per game? Because that's kind of the realm you need to live in. If the defense is really going to be as effective as they need to be, be able to have the pass rush working complimentary, getting turnovers with the secondary, you need your offense to be able to give you some leads. And, and and listen, I, I, we already know what this offense can be. We we know what the talent the talent around them is, and they are going to go as far as their quarterback. I I don't need elite play from that position, but I need we they need twenty four to twenty seven points per game if they're going to consistently put themselves in the best possible place to win. Yeah, I, th- that's exactly it. So who, who gives you that? Who, well, which quarterback gives you that? Drew Locke gets you more points per drive than Teddy Bridgewater if you care the creek. Check their careers. Well, yeah, he we, just we, does. We kind of broke that down saying, right. well, Teddy Bridgewater is going to get you three. Like, right. you get three right. points with Teddy yeah, Bridgewater. You're probably going to get, you know, you're probably going to wind up your, your punter field goal with Teddy Bridgewater and the occasional touchdown. And then you're, you know, with Drew Locke, you're going to get touchdowns, but, you know, you're going to have interceptions too. And so you got to figure that out. Is Drew, is the, is the chance that Drew Locke improves greater than the chance that Garrett Bowles gets called for a holding penalty? Because the minute that happens, that's a dead drive. Danny Bridgewater's not going to bring you back from for first and 18. Yeah. He's just not going to do it. All right, so let's uh, transition off the quarterbacks. Let's get to some uh, other positions here. The wide receivers today, Tim Patrick made some nice plays. Mm-hmm. Didn't get to call his number very much the first day. He was a really, really big play uh, guy for them today. Albert Okuebanam making a couple of nice plays. Got a, got a nice crosser. By the way, he's our guest on Broncos Country Tonight, the radio show. You can check it out, broncoscountrytonight.com. But... I, I like to see the fact that you do have a lot of other guys sort of stepping up. Cortland Sutton, I thought he ramped up even more mm. today. Jerry Judy had a nice catch. But again, you know, would, Jerry Judy's not relied on. It, it can't always be the Jerry Judy show. Mm-hmm. KJ Hamler had some more catches today. I love the idea of this offense being where we're going to spread it around to everybody and everybody's going to get a chance to eat because we came into the season wondering, okay, are there maybe too many mouths to feed, too many top-end wide receivers? Hey, there might be games, and I'd say multiple games, you're going to have nine guys touch the ball. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm okay with that. And whoever's hungry that day or whoever gets fed that day, you know, th- th- that, that situation will work itself out. But, you know, it, it's, it's going to be, if we're going with Teddy Bridgewater, you need receivers that can create after the catch because they're going to have to create after the catch. Jerry Judy kind of offers you some of that. Cortland's not really that guy. Cortland's more of a, you know, he's more of a Michael Thomas type mm-hmm. receiver. You know, you put it in my area, I'm going to catch it. There's not going to be a huge yak total, but, you know, and he'll make spectacular catches, but there's not going to be a huge yak percentage with that. Hamler and Judy, more of the yak guys. Uh, Tim Patrick, more of the contested catch, less yak guy. So it's going to be interesting to see, based on which quarterback wins, how that, that division of assets goes as well. Yeah. Uh, offensive line was pretty status quo today as far as any rotations go. D-line got the better of the O-line today. But, again, we're not in pads. That's the other part yeah. of this. We're not in pads yet, and so the, the D-line's getting pressure, and that's that's also affecting certain things. One, a quarterback who dumps it down is going to look a lot better than a guy who doesn't have the time to throw the ball. Yeah, there was a couple of moments today especially, and, and as we saw Teddy Bridgewater get the first snaps of mm-hmm. practice, they did actually alternate a little bit later on. Drew got to work with the ones in the red zone. So they, they kind of they still kept the 50-50 alternating kind of thing, even though Teddy was the first guy out. But there were some interesting moments. You mentioned pressure. I mean, they, they uh, Alexander Johnson was in the backfield. Uh, McTelvin Aguim and Shelby Harris both got batted passes today. Tuska had what would have been a sack. That's right. Uh, Tuska yeah, I think was, it was back ripping, there. But, I, you know, he would have had a sack on yes. that nib and lock. I can't remember. But yeah, it was one but of them. I mean, um, and then even Marquise Spencer yeah. got a, a nice pressure. So, mm-hmm. I mean, yes, you're right. The defensive line had a really good day. But those are kinds of things that, like you said, with the, the pads coming on here in a few days, that's where we kind of get a, a real sense about where each side of the ball in the trenches is really at. Yeah. And it's it, like, I, I, you know, I'm doing the scorecard thing on Twitter because that's what you do. But yeah. reality is, you know, we're really waiting for them to put pads on and, and go from there. And that that's the point where we start to really start to tally this thing. Yeah, but, but just for example, though, with the running backs, because that's another example of, of where with the pads coming on, that's what we're going to see. 
Melvin Gordon looks fantastic. I can't say enough nice things He's about how, back how good he looks out there. Javante Williams got to be the second guy up today. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he's going to, you know, just like a, every rookie, most of the time, they want to see them elevate. They want to see them earn the added spot in the, in the depth chart and moving up the depth chart. I think people are going to fall in love with Mike Boone. Every time he touches yeah. the ball, he looks smooth running good, the ball. Good player. And I think he is. I, I think he's going to get the short end of the stick in terms of total carries, but he, he's, uh, he, he looks good. He looks smooth out there. We had our first turnover of training camp, and that was Caden Stearns caught mm-hmm. an interception there from uh, Brett Rippon during 7-on-7. Seven seven. And again, with 7-on-7, seven seven, it's a little bit of a grain of salt kind of thing because it's not team. Everybody's is, dropping back. That's You're right. at a disadvantage, actually, as a quarterback. But You are. Uh, I don't know. That's an interesting thing you bring up because I always thought the offense had the advantage of the 7-on-7. Seven seven because, no, because of the no pass rush? Yeah. Yeah, but the problem is that everybody's dropping back, so you're minus one in terms of you're, you're throwing into plus one coverage. So it, 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 it's actually a statistical disadvantage for the offense. Okay. I, I guess that kind of makes sense. But in this case, yeah, Caden Stearns ended up getting the first interception. I, I thought the, the, the defense is a little more vocal today. I, I don't think it was a bad practice for the offense by mm. any stretch. And I said yesterday at, during the show that I thought that the offense and defense actually were pretty evenly matched. I thought they did a good job. Today, uh, I'd probably lean a little bit closer to the defense um, they had a dropped interception from Drew Locke that, mm-hmm. that could have happened um, or early on in practice. Uh, Caden Sturge with the interception, the defensive line getting more pressure. I kind of give them a slight edge today. But again, as the Broncos defense has been susceptible to in the past, as we've seen Derek Carr do this to them, the short passes, the quick, efficient passes, they can be sort of like a million paper cuts, but they can be had that way. Right. Who knew that death by inches was actually going to be the uh, the, the slogan <laughs> for the Teddy Bridgewater <laughs> offense? Death by inches. <laughs> But I mean, that's what it is. And that's, and we've seen that in the past, the Broncos pass rush, it's completely nullified. Mm-hmm. If you got a guy that's going to get the ball out super quick. Mm-hmm. And, and then again, it kind of puts the onus on the DBs. It puts it, I mean, you got to be quick tackling, but again, if you're getting four or five yards per catch, sometimes maybe more, if you break away on a couple of these, that could be a bit of a problem, but it's good for the Broncos. I think ultimately to practice against that. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what I'm taking away from this time, whether Teddy Bridgewater wins the job or not. Yeah. And, and that's, you know, like I said, we're continuing to monitor and everything like that, but it's too early to make judgment calls on any of this stuff. Teddy has looked more efficient. He may win the job, but I don't want to, I don't want to sit here and make judgment calls Two practices. They with no pads on. Yep. All right. So there you go. That are the thoughts for day two of Broncos training camp. We'll be back tomorrow for day three, as always find on the Broncos YouTube channel and check us out on our website, broncoscountrytonight.com for our podcast breakdowns. We'll talk to you tomorrow.